question of today's speaker, Dr. Carpenter serves as the president, CEO, and founder of Infinity IV Consulting, which is a boutique um, academic and educational consulting firm. Um, in her academic career, she has received acceptances to several prestigious institutions, including Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Cornell, um, um, Brown, Stanford, Johns Hopkins, and Duke, and she has extensive interviewing, writing and editing, as well as strategy building with hundreds of students from top tier schools. We're super excited to have you join us today, Dr. Carpenter, and I'd like to kick it over to you for today's presentation. Thank you so much, Jani, um, and thank you so much for advanced e-clinical training um, for having me for this session. I'll go ahead and, and pull this up and just let me know, Jani, if you're able to see this. Yep, I can see it. Perfect. So thank all, thanks all, to all of you joining the call today and those of you who happen to see this on demand. And so interviewing strategies for exceptional results. Um, and so I'll tailor this mostly to people who are interested in going to medical school, PA school, NP school, or other health professional schools. But ultimately, a lot of these things are transferable for those who are looking for a job in healthcare um, or otherwise. And they may not be tailored towards things if you're looking to do something in management consulting, but I imagine you wouldn't be here um, if that were the case. And so essentially, like anything else that you do to get into any kind of health profession school or health profession job, um, you have to take interviewing and preparing for interviews just as seriously as you would in the um, courses that you're taking, the prerequisites that you have on putting together your resume or your CV of different curriculars and extracurriculars, and then also um, the tests that you have as well. So interviewing is just as important um, skill to master and be able to have a number of strategies. And that's what I hope to, to get in part with you today, a number of those strategies so you can be exceptional in your results. What I mean by that is a number of different things. Exceptional can be um, the interviewer walks away and says that candidate uh, is very prepared Prepared. They're thorough, they're very thoughtful, they're humorful, they're engaged. So a number of different things that we want people to say about all of you uh, with your interviewing for the next phase. So some key objectives, we're going to master some of the pearls and pitfalls of interviewing. We'll dissect those interview question types because that is part and parcel. Um, if you know the different type of questions that you're getting, then you'll have specific strategies of how you will address those types of questions. We'll master the STAR method of interviewing. So situation, task, action, and result that some of you may have heard of, which is a great way to be able to tell stories about your experiences um, uh, that you've had previously, to be able to do that in a very organized and succinct fashion. And then we'll also develop effective verbal and nonverbal communication skills. So a little bit about me, so Jenny had mentioned, so I am the founder, president, and CEO of Infinity IV Consulting. Uh, you can find me at infinityivconsulting.org. I do have 16 years of interviewing experience specifically with several hundred uh, applicants. So I've had a number of different um, students uh, that I've helped gain entry into MDDO programs as well as PA and MP programs, although I do predominantly work with pre-medical students as well as medical students uh, and those who are pre-fellows. And I've helped people from all over the world. So as you can see, I've had a number of students uh, in the United States, in Canada, Mexico, but I also have a number of people who are in India, Pakistan, Costa Rica, uh, Bangladesh, as well as others. So definitely consider myself to be the kind of person to tailor my interviewing um, uh, package to all kinds of people, uh, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what kind of health uh, program that you're getting into, um, as well as if you're someone who comes from a family of nurses or of doctors, or your first generation within the healthcare field or first generation college, I'm able to really work with different types of populations. And I'll also say as well that I've worked with a number of people outside of that. So I do have a background. I'm, I'm a physician entrepreneur, um, but I also have uh, an MBA and an MPH, so a background in business and public health, as well as education. So that allows me when I do interview people um, to give them that really uh, different experience than like the typical person would uh, when you're looking for that career counseling uh, and that career advice um, for interviews or applications or otherwise. And I've also done things in terms of helping people compare for things such as comparative financial law. So I really think I have a, a versatility in terms of the services that I can offer and the types of people that I can reach. So just a few um, things that people have said about me. So uh, one of the things that my clients tend to uh, say is I definitely help to push people to improve their responses and their performance. So you might say, um, let me go online and go ahead and get the, the best tips and tricks 
on, on how to interview, um, but there is something to be said about working with someone who will push you um, to the next level. Uh, and my insights tend to be very um, thoughtful, and I go into not only just how well some people are doing verbally, but also how well they're doing non-verbally as well. And we'll go into some of those strategies in a little bit. Um, I'm also very detailed, and so I can start with someone who has already been interviewing already. So I work with people who they've already had a couple interviews, they didn't think they went well when they were going to med school, residency, or some other health professional school. And I do start with people who they're starting from the very beginning, and it's one of their very first interviews they've ever had um, in their life. So kicking it off, so interviewing pearls. The biggest thing, um, say when you get that first question, which is typical across medical school, PA, or even regular jobs is that tell me about yourself. And the biggest way to, to create that great first impression within the first 30 seconds is to have that captivating and emotive story. And some of the things that I've heard that are very captivating and emo uh, emotive uh, and emotion filled are when people talk about where they're from. And so people may talk about, say for instance, I'm from Southern California, I'm from a family of doctors, or I'm from a family of hardworking people who've mostly done agriculture and I'm first generation. I've heard things uh, where people have told me where I've been a chess master uh, in high school, or I've been, um, you know, one of the best in jujitsu. But basically look for those things that are very unique about you. It could be very personal to some of the skills, the talents that you've cultivated over time. And it can also be things uh, within your family as well. But the biggest thing is, is that you're strategic about, if I have this, tell me about yourself, what is it going to tell the interviewer? So it's not only just being able to um, talk about why you want the position, why you want to go to medical school, PA school, et cetera, um, but it's also having that personal feel. So I wanted to really highlight that because that can be a thing where when they tell me about yourself, um, people usually either just result entirely to doing a quick dump of the resume or they, they talk entirely um, about hobbies, but it's a really nice blend of both of those um, that allow you to have the biggest impact. Impact. Secondly, I will say um, the use of metaphors, quotes, humor, and I will even add statistics, which is not on this slide. These are things that really propel an exceptional um, interviewee. And so some of the things that I've heard that have been um, very interesting in metaphors. So someone who was interviewing with me who wanted to go into radiology. And one of the first things he said to me is, I love radiology because it's like the third eye of medicine. And it's been about two years since I interviewed him. And he went to one of the top um, uh, pro interview uh, programs in radiology in the country. Um, and I believe it was because of a lot of his interview used very simple metaphors like this that were very interesting and stuck with the interviewer um, throughout and made him a st uh, standout candidate. Other things can be quotes. So when you're talking about, tell me about yourself or you're describing your strengths or your weaknesses, you could use quotes. So for instance, you could say, I'm the kind of person who loves uh, to belong to my ambition, or I'm the kind of person um, who pick a phrase that you like. And so that will be very interesting and stand out. The other thing is if you're using humor, and so this can be done delic delicately and lightly, um, depending on what type of uh, person that you're interviewing with, but if you focus on uh, being able to bring some humor into the situation, um, then that might be able to really uh, push, push the, the envelope in terms of your candidacy for that program or that job. The other thing is one of the biggest questions, whether, regardless of if it's med school, PA, um, or other job is, why do you want to do this program? Why do you want to come to this school? Why do you want to do, et cetera? Um, having that compelling, comp incredible answer is the most important. And you might say, well, what does that actually mean? It means that it is very believable and it's captivating. So for medical school or PA, I usually advise people to have anywhere from three to six reasons as to why they want to do a certain program um, and making sure that those things are a blend of personal and professional reasons. So that could be the sense of intellectual curiosity um, that you'll be able to have uh, once you become a physician, or it may be that you love solving puzzles and that's why you want to be an internal medicine physician, or it could be that you love working with the entire uh, population of patients from pediatrics to geriatrics, et cetera. So having a number of reasons, and then also um, that can be tied to your own personal story as well, um, growing up, things that happened to your family, things that happened to you, things that happened to people that you cared about. Um, you can interweave those into very strong answers as to why you want to do a program or a job. Next, I'll say the exuding passion, confidence, maturity, professionalism are absolutely important. One of the things I notice is that sometimes people either consciously or subconsciously are only thinking about, let me just do this interview, let me kind of check it off the box and I've done it, or they kind of um, only see themselves in terms of how well they perform as opposed to thinking about 
all of the other applicants who are actually interviewing as well. So it's important to think about what is your passion level? What's your level of confidence and maturity and professionalism and how you're coming across and all of the interview questions? Because inevitably, you're not just judged by how, you know, your own performance against your own benchmark. You're judged by all the other people. So that's very uh, important as well. So you may have, a, you may feel that you have a great interview, but the biggest thing is whether or not you get into that med school, that PA school, that job of choice is how did you compare to everyone else? Because it's ultimately um, the biggest thing. And I'll finally say here on this slide, having a breadth and depth of answers to a variety of questions that you get. So when you're asked about strengths, weaknesses, why this program, how you distinguish yourself, um, tell me about the time that you've managed conflicts, tell me about the time that you've been able to prioritize different tasks. Um, if you're able to pull multiple things from your resume, your CV, and your application, and not necessarily just rely on one or two experiences to answer a number of different questions. One, this allows to show um, that you have had a number of, of experiences, but also it allows you to go in depth about a number of different skills that you've built over time. So other common pitfalls um, to think about. Um, when it comes to interviewing for medical school, PA school, they will have your resume, your application in front of them. So when people, you, when an interviewer goes to ask you about your experience and you don't have um, anything to really say about, um, you said that you were president of the pre-medical club, but you don't really have a memory of all of that. And you can't give details. That's one of the huge pitfalls because it will show that you have um, less credibility because you're not able to remember it or able to have a lot of detail. So make sure that you know your CV, your resume, your application in and out. Um, and have at least three to five bullet points that you can speak successfully to if you if your interviewer happens to go for that particular experience. The other thing is, is preparing sufficiently um, for all different types of questions, and we'll go into this. So there's the traditional questions that I've been talking about. Tell me about yourself. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Why this program? But there are other types of questions as well that we'll go into, those that are behavioral as well as situational questions. So the tell me about a time when you did X or what would you do in Y situation? So knowing how to prepare and have strategies to answer those types of questions are important because I've found in my experience, some people are very common, very comfortable with common questions and less comfortable with those behavioral situational questions. And it's usually because they haven't practiced as frequently. The other thing is, is needing to practice that full interview experience. If you're just practicing individual questions here and there, it may not get you where you need to be because ultimately you'll be interviewing um, with any number of questions. Your shortest interview might actually go 15 minutes, but it may go an hour or longer. So being able to prepare, what is that momentum, that stamina that you're going to have and what are the potential areas where you tend to struggle? Do you tend to get tired? To, do you tend to get nervous about uh, questions that are tough? Do you tend to get uncomfortable? Uh, when you have an interviewer who has a deadpan expression. So making sure that you practice that full interview experience in a variety of settings so that you know um, how you're going to perform. The other thing is, is seeing the interview as a formality. And I've mentioned this before, um, the interview can make or break you. I've had many um, applicants that I've worked with where um, they had just, they'd gotten one interview um, for the entire um, cycle for medical school and it was their one shot and they were able to make it because they took that very seriously. Next is not knowing one's blind spots. And so I mentioned this before as well. So knowing like, do you tend to have certain things that you do, looking down, looking up, looking to the side, having distracting hand movements, having um, things that you do in terms of verbally, in terms of ending abruptly or ending as if you're asking a question. So knowing what those blind spots are, are important. And then knowing how to not be incongruent or irrelevant. So basically what I mean by this is if you're asked a question to directly answer it, to not dodge the question, um, and not to answer something uh, that is too far off the mark. So if you're asked about, um, you know, how you've done leadership and you start talking about um, how you've been hiking in uh, different places around the world, that's pretty um, irrelevant and incongruent to the particular question. And we talked about the body language, and we'll go into that a little bit more. And then the other issue is having conflicting verbal and nonverbal communication. So basically, you might be saying one thing and sound confident, but your facial expressions, your body position may say something different. It may show that you're anxious. It may show that you seem uncertain. And so your interviewer will pick up on those things, and that may tank an interview. So continuing to go a little bit deeper. So 
not being able to articulate one's strengths, weaknesses, or distinguishing traits for any academic program, fellowship, job is a huge thing. And one of the things I very much encounter with people is not being able to articulate uh, what those are. Um, well, I don't really know what my strengths are, or I don't really have any weaknesses. Number one thing that you should not do. So to have a strategy for this, um, do some self-reflection on what are the things that I tend to do really well? What are the things that I do better than um, average people? And then in terms of weaknesses, what are the things um, that I tend to struggle with um, in my job? And if you feel that it's difficult to have that reflection, then you can go out, ask your family, your friends, your colleagues, but um, always make sure that you've done your due diligence in terms of understanding what are your strengths and weaknesses, and then distinguishing traits. How do I um, compared to everyone else. And the biggest thing with this is not to say that you're being um, uh, over boasting when it comes to that, but really have done doing your research. What are the other things about the other medical students at this at this program, the other, um, you know, uh, practicing um, students for uh, the PA school, NP school. Um, if you do that research, then you can see, well, how am I different? What are the things that overlap that I have in common with them? And what are the things that are not? And then you can make a very compelling answer um, to that question. Next is making sure that when you're talking about that job, that program, that you are you don't have a rationale that is cliche um, or inadequate. So something cliche would be boasting about, oh, I would love to go to Harvard Medical School because it's Harvard or Harvard's number one. That's cliche. Um, that's not very specific and granular in terms of, I love um, this program because it allows me to do this scholarship thing, which I've, I've actually been doing on a number of things um, as my extracurriculars that matches with that. Um, or inadequate, um, saying a few things, but not really going into depth about them as well. So making sure that you have robust reasons for going somewhere, and they can be a number of personal and professional uh, reasons as well. Also with interviewing, you want to make sure that you're specific and granular um, with your answers. You can speak very vaguely about things if someone says, what are your strengths? And you can say, I'm a great team player. That's not very specific or granular. An even better answer would be, I'm a great team player. I can tell you about a time within the last six months where I felt that my teamwork really shined. Or I can tell you within the last um, three weeks when my leadership um, really uh, showcased itself. And that was when I was dealing with X, Y, Z, et cetera. So being more specific and granular allows you, one, to be more credible, but also to stand above the crowd. And then I'll go into the issue of humility versus grandstanding. And there are some people, um, and this might be you, who tend to downplay their accomplishments and strengths. And, and don't do that. Um, the biggest thing with the interview is to focus on you, your achievements, your contributions um, in the past, as well as your potential in the future. And so um, stray away from some of those expressions that would say, oh, it was nothing, or the, the rest of the team that did that, I didn't do that. I was just doing my job. Those things are overly humble um, and they actually can uh, make it so that uh, you don't appear as if you have um, the strengths that you do. So don't do that um, excessively. And then on the other side, not to have excessive bragging or grandstanding. Uh, so essentially saying like everything I do turns to gold or people always think, think that I'm right. Essentially the biggest thing you want with the interview is have that perfect a blend of competence and humility, which allows you to be seen as, as more confident. Um, so that's articulating your achievements and your contributions and focusing on what you've done, but then also recognizing the contribution of others, recognizing where you can continue to grow as well. So that's how you really show um, that confidence and, and not seem too humble, but then not grandstanding at the same time. So benefits of doing a mock interview. So the biggest thing uh, when I've seen with people who come to me is that they've either had no uh, formal mock interview experience or they've uh, maybe have uh, performed uh, a mock interview in front of the mirror for themselves, or maybe they've done it with friends and family and colleagues. Um, and regardless of, of what you've done before, there's no harm in having a more formal um, mock interview. Well, that's with someone who knows how to give you that tailored comprehensive advice, because oftentimes when you're doing it in front of the mirror, or with friends or families, or say an inexperienced colleague who does an interview on a regular basis, the advice that you might get is often imperfect and imbalanced. Things that I tend to hear people say is, 
my family will focus on that I say the word um too much, or you could have said this differently, or that didn't sound good. And that's not uh, comprehensive feedback, but it also doesn't give you a good roadmap as to where to go. So the biggest thing about the mock interview is you can really see and hone in on what are the strengths that I have verbally in my interview? What are the things that I need to work on verbally? And then what are the things that I'm doing non-verbally with my eyes, with my, my hands, uh, with my shoulders, um, all of my non-verbal communication that are really either winning the interview or distracting from it. So it's important to do that mock interview to know those blind spots that you might have to simulate the whole uh, interview so that you're not having interruptions. So you actually see exactly how am I going to perform? And that pressure to perform allows you to be able to problem solve and have better decision making skills when the real interview is actually happening. So um, I would continue to stress how important that is. So presence in interviews, and I've, I've said this before, but I'll cont continue to underscore that. Even when I see applicants who they know they're receiving their resume in and out, and they do have thoughtful, well-crafted answers, the biggest thing that might actually be the reason that they don't get accepted or they get waitlisted is because they may fail to establish rapport with their interviewer. And what that means is ask, uh, asking questions to the interviewer and asking thoughtful, insightful questions. And it doesn't have to just be at the end, right, where it says, where the interviewer says, do you have any questions? It can be throughout the interview. It can be failing to respond um, to the interviewer if they make a comment about something. Um, go ahead and, and engage with what that, that conversation is and be flexible and adaptable to what you might say um, and how you might engage with that person. And then making sure that you're demonstrating interest throughout the interview so that presence can, can be huge. And then energy. And so energy, a lot of people ask me, how do you define energy? And I'll say that that can really be distilled into confidence, engagement, how effective your communication is, the memorability of your impression, as well as the positive atmosphere that you create. If it's a one-on-one -on -one with an interviewer, if it's um, with um, two, uh, interviewers or if, if it's in a group interview environment, um, energy is huge. And in fact, I'll say that energy will actually carry you over, even if your answers are just a little bit um, less than perfect, a little bit less than thorough. But if you have that exuberance and that enthusiasm, that can actually be very winning in some circumstances. So what do I mean by um, that level of energy? That may, may be the change in the tone of your voice, the inflection, so not just being monotone. That may be the variety of facial expressions that you have smiling at appropriate moments, being serious, serious at other moments, the way that you use your hands. If you notice, I've tried to have very open hand movements when I've been talking during this lecture, but not doing hand wringing, not doing a lot of facial touching, et cetera, having that high energy where you move in towards um, the interviewer or other people that might be in the room. All of those can be very radiating and positive uh, for the interview. So I'll go ahead and I'll switch gears here and we'll really start to dissect what those interview types, uh, interview question types are. And they range anywhere from common and traditional questions to behavioral and situational questions to even bizarre questions. So I'll talk about what some of the, them are right now and then we'll go into the actual strategy for them uh, afterwards. So common and traditional questions. These are the ones that I've been repeating frequently. Tell me about yourself. Why do you want this job? Why do you want to be a physician, a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner? Um, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Why this program? What distinguishes you from other people? Uh, what distinguishes you from other applicants? Those are very common traditional questions. Behavioral questions. Tell me about a time when you showed leadership, when you had to give negative feedback, when you had to um, prioritize different tasks. Tell me about a time um, when you demonstrated creativity or you're very persuasive. Those are behavioral questions. Those are things, what have you done in the past? Versus situational questions. What would you do in this hypothetical scenario if you're dealing with a difficult patient, if you had an underperforming colleague, if you had a mean coworker, if you happen to have um, someone who you suspected was cheating um, in your environment or who had forged some research um, or some other documentation? And then finally, when it comes to bizarre questions, these are ones that sometimes uh, you'll get one of them. Sometimes you may not see them for quite a long time if you're on doing an interview trail. And other times there might be certain schools or programs that use quite a few of these and it can throw people off if you're not ready for them. And those may be the kind of, of questions where they are, what kind of superhero would you be if you could be a superhero? If you were on a desert island, what three things, what three golden rules would you implement or what three things would you want on that island? So they're very kind of 
um, out there. And we'll talk about um, the strategies for that, for those as well. But before we do, we'll go into the STAR method. So STAR stands for situation, task, action, and results. And I'll be honest, the first time that I learned about STAR over 20 years ago, I also thought, okay, that's that's well and good, but how does that help me? And I will say that it helps you tremendously. And it's not just an intellectual exercise. It's a great way to be able to organize all of the uh or the majority of answers that you have during any given interview. And some people I've noticed do this very naturally and, and setting up and contextualizing exactly what the situation was that they were involved in and then being able to then talk about what action they specifically took and the results. And then other people don't, um, especially story storytellers who like to jump right into the action and potentially kind of go backwards and go forwards. The STAR method can really help you rein some of those, uh, those habits in. So definitely would recommend uh, the star situation task action results. So an example that I have here, and we'll go into some other examples on the next slide, is a situation. So you always timestamp um, in the star method, um, because when you tell a story, your interviewer doesn't know, did this happen yesterday? Did this happen three months ago? Did this happen six years ago? And it's very important, especially because you want many of the things that you're talking about in your interview to be as close to the, the time period that you're at. Um, unless you have to talk about something that did happen 10 years ago, but for the most part, you want to show that you are giving relevant examples. You don't want to talk about your leadership that was over 20 years ago. You want to talk about something that's far more relevant and closely time bound to, to the present. So in this situation, um, I was a junior in college. That was two years ago. I served as the president of my university's pre-medical society situation. Task. My goal was to enhance the support system for my other pre-med students and organize different informative events. Action. I initiated regular study groups, and I not only participated in including this inclusive environment, but I helped organize uh, workshops on the MCAT preparation, bring in guest speakers for the medical field, and inspire and guide aspiring students. And the result? As a result, this, the, our, our pre-med society increased participation and academic performance among members, fostering a very tight-knit community. This experience honed my leadership skills and underscored the importance of mentorship and academic pursuits. Um, so as you can see, it's a nice bite-sized story. It doesn't just necessarily jump in on talking about why I organized MCAT preparation that was two years ago that taught me leadership, but I also like was able to fundraise 500. Instead, it goes nicely and chronologically in a way that your interviewer can follow in a way that shows that you are organized and prepared. So effective answer strategy per question type. And so I think this is actually um, an a very strong slide. If there's nothing else that you really take from this in terms of strategy, it's this particular slide. How do I answer um, any given type of, of question? So a common question, which is the tell me about yourself. Um, firstly, ensure that you're addressing the key areas of that question, right? Aim to answer that question with at least two overarching statements and one specific concrete time bound example. Um, utilize the STAR method if appropriate. And then also try to roadmap into signpost. And what I mean by that is roadmapping is I'm going to tell you three um, things um, that I think are essential to who I am uh, as a candidate for this job. Or if you're asked, why do I want to go to medical school? I have a um, four strong reasons, personally and professionally, that really led me to the path of medicine. So that's road mapping. Where am I going to go? So your interviewer knows, okay, I'm going to expect that, uh, those four things. And then signposting is when you say firstly, secondly, thirdly, you basically transition um, very cleanly and very nicely. And you don't have to use firstly, secondly, thirdly. Um, you can say to start. You can say to begin. Um, you can also say first and then go to and next. And then you can end with and finally. And then you can also do a summarization statement as well, which is uh, frequently what I advise people to do, especially if a little bit longer um, answer to a common question that can really tie it all together, because not only did you roadmap it, you told your particular answer, but then you summarized it um, very well at the end. For behavioral questions, what did you do during why scenarios? So I mentioned that before. You can use all of the points above, um, having those overarching statements. Um, using the STAR method if appropriate, road mapping and, and signposting. But then the biggest thing with those is highlight your values, your priorities, and your preferences as a person and a professional. Um, and use an example that can be directly relevant to the question. So for instance, for instance, if someone said, um, what did you do, um, say when you had um, a struggling colleague, 
And so you can go and say, um, there's about three things um, that I want to tell you in terms of how I was able to manage um, that significant conflict that really showcased uh, my ability um, to resolve things peacefully, as well as that showcased my sense of empathy and leadership. So those are my overarching statements. Um, and you also are talking about um, I have a lot of empathetic understanding towards my colleagues. I was able to sit down with them, um, understand where they were coming from, and then we were able to figure out a plan together, um, perhaps if they needed more time to be able to prepare for certain tasks, um, if they needed to be able to have more professional development. So I showcased the fact that I kept my values of empathy, my priorities of being able to uh, meet with people and have that thought uh, partnership with them, and my preferences uh, to solve things peacefully as opposed to strong arming things. For situational questions, what would you do in X scenario? So same thing before, overarching statements, using a STAR method, signposting or road mapping. Then you can also use um, real life examples as well. So if someone says, what would you do um, if you had a colleague that you found um, was uh, cheating. So some of the things that you could do would say um, that would be a, a serious situation. And there were three things that I want to be able to consider. Um, one, not being able to use too many assumptions, um, being able to not jump to conclusions um, and have a, a less judgmental attitude, and then be able to uh, get the appropriate authorities involved. And then you tell the story um, exactly of how you might go about that. And then you may actually talk about, and there was an actual situation where I had to do this. And that might actually add for an even greater answer than just to say, oh, I would do X, Y, Z if you connect it to, and I've actually dealt with this situation before, if you happen to have dealt with it before. And then finally, bizarre questions. So if you're asked, um, what kind of superhero would you be? The point is, is what is the point of this question? What is the meaning that you're going to take from it and how you're going to define that meaning? So this instance that I have, uh, it, example that I have, I want to be Spider-Man. But you don't say I want to be Spider-Man because I want to fly through the air and I want to be able to have spider webs that come out of my hands or Spider-Man is super cool. You tie it to, well, I'm applying to medical school or I'm applying to PA school or I'm applying to whatever. So for in this instance, I want to be Spider-Man because he has great flexibility and adaptability, resilience, and he's fearless. I want to have all of these as a physician to be able to deal with diverse patients in challenging medical situations. So you tie um, specific things about Spider-Man to values and priorities that you care about. So your interviewer knows what those things are. And then you translate it into how is it relevant to the program or the job that you're applying to? And that's the most successful way to answer those types of questions as well. I'll pause to see if there's any questions there. All right, we'll, we'll keep going. So ways to sync the interview. Um, and oftentimes some people will tell me these are um, pretty commonsensical and they are, but the thing that's interesting of, of the hundreds of people that I've worked with um, over uh, the past decade and more is that even if people intellectually know these things, um, people nonetheless find themselves falling into these, these pitfalls. So I wanna make sure that I continue to highlight them and also talk about the strategies so that you don't fall into these things that you're like, yes, I know that, but I still made that mistake anyway. We don't want that to be you. So the first one is lack of preparation. And so that could be not knowing the type of questions that you'll be asked. So you can go anywhere online and be able to, to find what are the high yield questions that you're going to get asked for medical school, for dental school, um, for certain types of jobs. They are there. It's, it's very um, difficult to be interviewing for something where there isn't a roadmap for that. So knowing what kinds of questions you'll be asked. Are they going to be predominantly traditional? Am I going to get a mix of behavioral and situational questions? Will I get some bizarre questions? So being able to know what am I going to be asked and I'm going to have my strategy for how I'm going to prepare for them. Next is making sure you, you do a full audit of your resume and CV or your application, as I meant before, and you have at least three to five bullet points that you can say about any experience. And that clue includes even research experience, publications, abstracts, poster presentations that you have uh, as well, because all of those are fair game that can be asked during an interview. And then I'll reiterate this, which I've said many times before, is having a strong uh, reflection of your strengths, your weaknesses, your distinguishing traits, because those are absolutely critical uh, in being able to differentiate you um, from other applicants. So poor body language. 
Um, and so um, those can be simple things such as slumped shoulders, having arms crossed, sitting back, not sitting forward. I know a lot of interviews these days are happening on Zoom. So making sure that you're the appropriate distance from the camera, not too far back, but not too far forward either. Those, those things um, can matter as well. So I definitely have, have counseled people who basically were just all head and no body on a Zoom call and then people who are way too far back or they were sitting in a chair uh, with their arms basically were like this. So make sure that you, you are practicing all of your nonverbal communication, uh, just as much as you're practicing the content uh, of what your interview is. And so if you need other people to comment on, on how all those things are, make sure that you're doing, at, uh, doing that as well. Ineffective communication. So this can uh, span the gamut in terms of not providing sufficient detail or context to any interview question. And so frequently what uh, I've seen people do is they say, well, I want to be very succinct. And I think if people are thinking very much about, I want to be very succinct, or they're worried about talking too much, or they think, or they perceive that, oh, I, I can't spend too much time on this question because I know that there's only so there's only 15 minutes to this interview. Most of the time, they'll actually shortchange themselves. So don't focus too much on worrying about that. The interviewer will prompt you if they need to move you forward. Focus on answering the question um, as thoroughly as you can, but then obviously striving to be concise. Uh, failing to answer the target question, answering another question. And so even though there are strategies, when you get a question, you're like, I quite can't answer that, where you try to answer something that's very similar, and it, it can be important, um, make sure that you're not too tangential, um, because that uh, definitely will not account in your favor. Another ineffective communication thing would be speaking for long periods of time, uh, not being well organized, or not having themes to what you're saying. So basically, I'm going to speak and then I'm going to hope that like I'm going to say something good or some good things are going to come out of that. I definitely have seen people done that before. And this is where uh, preparation is absolutely key so that you don't fall into that trap. And then also speaking about irrelevant uh, topics. So if you're talking about getting into medical school, then you should be talking about why you're interested in medical school. You should be talking about your clinical experiences, your academic experiences that directly relate to your qualifications for that. And frequently, um, I will see people talking about things where the whole um, uh, medical interview is about how much they love research. Um, or how much they love policy or something very specific about, say, women's health, et cetera. And not to say that those things aren't important. They can be great attributes to the interview. But the biggest thing is to focus on the main point of the interview and not to stray too much, because otherwise your interviewer might say, well, if you're applying to medical school, but you talk too much about research, maybe you're, you actually want to just do research. Or if you're talking too much about policy, maybe you actually want to do policy. So be very careful about the balance that you have when you're talking about things so that you're not deemed as irrelevant or truly um, not interviewing for the appropriate thing. Uh, lack of confidence. So this goes into that nonverbal communication that is essential for you to prepare for as well. So that's excessive anxiety or discomfort that might come through with distracting eye movement, um, looking up and down frequently, or just staring into one um, part of space um, without much movement back to the green dot or back to uh, the person you're speaking to if you're on Zoom or obviously uh, in person. That could be facial touching. That's one of the most frequent things that I see that people aren't even aware that they're doing, that they're touching their face when they're saying things or they're touching their neck or they're playing with their hair. Um, other things could be facial grimacing, um, you know, it's basically frowning, um, uh, basically looking sad, um, eye flashing. So I can, I frequently will see this as well, um, where if people are anxious, their eyes will get really wide when they start speaking. And that can be a bit distracting and actually maybe a subtle reason why you might not uh, get into a program because of the excessive uh, anxiety that's conveyed by that. Other things could be excessive leg shaking, hand petting. So this is called petting the, the hamster or steepling, doing too much of this um, as well. So be aware what those blind spots might be that you have and work to be able to uh, be calm and figure out what are the things that I can do with my hands. Sitting on your hands is probably not a good strategy. Um, figuring out what is the, uh, the types of things I want to do with my hands and the pace in which I want to use them, not too excessively, because that can also go um, be detrimental as well. But figuring out um, what is it that I want to con communicate facially? What was it that I want to communicate with my eye contact, um, with my hands, with my shoulders, et cetera? 
And this lack of self-awareness feeds into the one um, just before as well. So knowing micro expressions. So sometimes people may not just have a sustained frown um, or sustained um, kind of eyes like, like deer in the headlight look. Um, people may just have these things that flash over their face, micro facial expressions, and knowing what those things are as well, because those can communicate not only just the nervousness, but they can also make your um, interviewer think that um, you're less professional or less serious if certain things um, kind of quickly display uh, over your face. The other thing is that you want to be important uh, to think about is your tone as well. Um, if you're being professional versus if you're being unprofessional, if you're being less serious. And I've seen this a few times where um, interviewees may get too comfortable with the interviewer. Um, and I obviously you have to play this by ear, but the biggest thing um, is to know like um, the level of professionalism that you should have, the type of language that you're using um, with your interviewer, because those can play into, especially if you're going into medicine, you're going, um, you know, to be a PA or an NP, it's like, how um, are you going to treat other patients? How are you going to treat your colleagues? Um, and all of that should be how you communicate during that interview. On the other side is that failure to ask questions. And it's not just the do you have any questions at the end and not having any questions? It's also not necessarily asking questions or appearing engaged throughout the interview. And sometimes I admit there's not always opportunities to do that, but if you're um, you're well prepared, there can be opportunities for you to slip in uh, questions in between when you're being asked things to show a higher level of engagement. But in terms of that prototypical failure to ask questions, I wanna disabuse people of that notion that by saying, I have no questions, at the end of an interview to say that means, oh, I fully understand it. I've researched this program, this job, I know what I'm doing. That's actually not what it communicates. It actually communicates that you're less engaged and less interesting. And that actually, so you may have a very strong interview, but if you don't have any questions, then you may be the person who's passed up because you appear to be less engaged, or you may come off as if you're a know-it-all. Um, you cannot ever know everything there is to know about a program or a job. And so being able to even prepare thoughtfully for questions for an interview is also uh, important as well. And it's something that I actually spent a lot of time on and have um, spent full sessions, 30 minutes to an hour, helping people to be able to even hone this micro skill within um, interviews. So inability to handle stress. Um, this is important and you may say, oh, this is a bit unfair that an interviewer um, would not give you the benefit of the doubt. And to say, and to say that all interviewers don't uh, would be untrue. Some would, but it's the biggest thing is um, to be able to handle it um, well enough. So the biggest things that show that your, your stress is getting the best of you is if there's excessive stuttering throughout the interview or you're blanking frequently on a number of questions, appearing defensive about certain questions um, and not, uh, not wanting to answer them or answering things very quickly or not meaningfully, um, or just entirely refusing to answer a question at all during an interview saying, I don't have any weaknesses or I don't think that's relevant. Um, all of those are absolute ways to sync um, the interview. So practice, practice, practice um, is important. Um, and so for people who I've met with where they say blanking out is one of my issues, we strategize on how they can prepare beforehand. And usually what I say is people need to prepare out their list of experiences so they know that inevitably they may be asked questions um, you know, uh, in ways that they can't anticipate, but they prepared say a number of six to 10 experiences that they know they can say, oh, I can talk about the time that I was pre-medical um, president, or I can talk about the time when I was helping with the homeless, or I can talk about this. And so you can, you know, the experiences that you want to talk about, and then you can decide to say, oh, this is a great time. They asked me about leadership. I think I can talk about this, or they asked me about problem solving, or they asked me about how I distinguish myself. And so you have more flexibility to be able to handle that stress, but then also um, to be prepared for any kind of situation as well. A negative attitude, and I don't see this too often, but it, it does happen occasionally. And so that can be anywhere from being defensive at certain questions. I've actually seen um, people get defensive. I'll say when you get purposely negative questions, and I will say that there are strategies that interviewers were used to be able to one, potentially stress you out on purpose, but then also to see um, how you respond to even slight criticism. So they might ask you things 
such as what would you do if you don't get into this program, you don't get this job, or why are you not qualified for this program or this job? Um, and these are standard um, questions. I don't, they're not necessarily asked all the time, but I would say that um, if you hear them, don't get defensive um, because they're meant to see what is your um, level of reflecting on yourself and what is the level of humility that you can have for what would you do if you didn't get a certain job or get into a certain program or why might you not be qualified? And I usually tell people, um, answer humbly and confidently, but then always turn it around and be positive with that kind of a question or any time the conversation seems to be going in a negative way. And then other ways um, to, to make sure that you're not having a negative attitude is being overly fixated on red flags. And so frequently uh, people will have red flags, uh, whether you know you like it or not. So um, not having done well on a certain course that's on your application, having um, a lower than a lower test score than you would appreciate, um, having certain time gaps on your resume. Um, so those things that are red flags. So um, when you're asked to talk about them, making sure that you have a plan that you can discuss them confidently concisely and humbly at the same time. And that means no, not over explaining, not going into uh, extra, uh, <laughs> uh, gratuitous detail and not over apologizing uh, for red flags. That's a, a big thing I tell people. Um, so you're not asking for uh, an apology uh, for a red flag on application. You're basically being able to concisely explain what you've learned from it um, and how you're uh, doing everything you can to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And then finally, lack of follow-up. Um, and so this could be um, obviously not following up at the end of an interview um, with, say, the, interv the interviewer, um, the program director of the program, program coordinator, et cetera. And people will say, well, I, I don't have somebody's direct email. There is someone most likely that you can uh, email them. So if you don't have the exact email address for the person who interviewed you, um, then try to email the person who set it up and then say, can you forward it to so-and-so? Um, it doesn't necessarily mean um, that you're guaranteed right, to get that job or into that program, but it does show a certain level of professionalism um, that's always important. And also having that follow through um, during the interview itself. And this is something that I would say the vast majority of people do not do, but it will make you absolutely stand apart from the rest. When your interviewer starts to, to talk uh, about themselves, their own research, their teaching, their background, and they're, they're generally having a conversation with you as opposed to just kind of jumping from one question to the next, um, take that opportunity to engage with them. Um, if they happen to tell you, oh, when I was in medical school, I did this. If you just um, nod or don't say anything, then you're missing a great opportunity to be able to build rapport with your interviewer and be able to essentially get them um, to like you, to be able to have um, that synergy, which those little things can go pretty far when it comes to everyone being um, in that admissions committee meeting and them saying, you know what, I really like so-and-so and we had a great conversation and having that great conversation is having that follow through and that back and forth during the actual interview. All right. Um, and so um, that is it. Um, if you're interested in more uh, detailed interview uh, prep, I do a number of different interview types, mock traditional behavioral situational interviews. Um, you can see it at affinityivconsulting.org, but I also do a number of other things as well in terms of strategic advising um, for how to um, do well in certain programs, um, as I said, mostly for medical, um, uh, pre-medical and medical students. Um, I do mock uh, mini interviews, uh, application prep, and then I have a number of boot camps as well. So if you are listening to this, um, you can use the discount code IV24, um, and you can use that um, to be able to uh, get um, the 25% discount on any of the different things uh, that is an Infinity IV uh, consulting. Uh, so thank you so much for that, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Carpenter. That was a wealth of information. I don't see any questions in the chat, so I, I guess I'll go ahead and kick off the Q&A session just to give folks some time to reflect, process all the information they've received and pop their questions in the chat. So you talked briefly about under-preparing for interviews. And I like to think that there's a thin line between under-preparing and over-preparing to the point where you rehearse so much, mm -hmm. you all sound robotic or just very scripted. And in your mm -hmm. experience, what are some tips you can share on how to balance you know, both? Yeah, absolutely. That is a great question. Um, and yeah, that is something that I think is, is the biggest issue. I will say that you can never prepare enough, but you can absolutely um, prepare like a script and sound rehearsed 
for sure. Um, so when, in terms of preparation, I would say like making sure that you're doing all those different types of questions, the common behavior situational, because inevitably, most of us when we're interviewing, we're going to get a question that we've not anticipated before. So that's why I say you can never prepare enough because you're going to get hit with something that you've not seen uh, before, especially, be, especially schools and programs are looking to be able to catch people off guard. So they will throw in that, that question here or there. Um, in terms of um, uh, not over rehearsing, um, so you can find yourself at that stage where you feel like, wow, I am being able to just quickly kind of um, answer this question uh, and it does sound rehearsed, then you have to work in work to um, be able to answer the question so that it doesn't sound rehearsed. So you're like, well, I know I've prepared it to, to that point where I sound rehearsed. So make sure that you're putting in more pauses or you're um, appearing to be more reflective. So it's basically like, don't answer as quickly. Um, if you do get that sense that, oh, wow, I'm starting to sound very rehearsed and scripted. So sound more conversational um, when you're actually doing it. Thank you. Um, I see one question in the chat and it asks, um, do you generally have an idea of who your interviewer is beforehand? Yeah, I I'd say great question. The vast majority of the times um, you do. So I would say applying to medical school, um, health profession school, usually you will um, be told who you're going to interview with. It'll be Dr. So-and-so or this person in this department. Um, so that'll uh, be key information that you can go and check the website, go on LinkedIn, um, be able to do a deeper dive on who this person is and, and background, who they are, what research they've had, have they done other types of talks before to get a sense of what their interests might be. Um, and then if you're only, if you only have this person and like they're in this department. So for instance, one of the, um, pre-meds that I helped recently, uh, she gave me the same thing. She said, okay, these are the people that I'm interviewing with. And she just had a list of this person and they're in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so if you just have like the department that they're in, then you can zone in on that. Okay. Obviously this person is going to care about this. So um, when I ask this person questions, I can direct it towards things that I know that are relevant to their particular role. Thank you, that's helpful. And can you talk a little bit about post-interview etiquette? I've, I've heard some best practices are to send a thank you email post-interview. If you haven't heard back, how often or how soon after your interview should you follow up? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think especially um, in the age that we're in, right, where everything um, is electronic, I would say that there are some places and programs that say do not follow up respect that uh, for sure because you don't want to, if you don't want to to go against the protocol so if they say that um, don't say oh uh, I'm just going to ignore that uh, listen to the protocol um, but if they don't have anything explicitly about not following up then for sure be able to if you can get that direct email of the person you interviewed with and keep it short um, so usually what you want is aim for about four sentences and not just the boilerplate generic thank you for emailing for um, interviewing me I loved it so much um, you can thank them, but then try to incorporate something that you learned um, or you remember from the interviewer. Like, um, I appreciate that we had this conversation about X. I learned so much. And then you can reiterate on, um, I really appreciate this program because you talk so much about all the opportunities um, with this, these types of internships within the program, et cetera, et cetera. So you um, make it very much um, personalized um, to what you actually discussed during the interview, but you keep it short at the same time because their, their time is valuable and busy as well. Thank you. Um, we have a few more questions in the Q&A and one asks, how do you regulate your heart rate or nervous system once you're in the room? I found this to be an issue no matter how much I prepare. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll try to answer that question a number of different ways. And, and it's something that even myself, you know, uh, uh, have dealt with when it comes comes to interviewing, especially if it's very high stakes. Um, I think it, it can be something where, yeah, our sympathetic nervous system is really, you know, at the max and our heart rate is, uh, is up, we're sweating, um, or any other thing that might be happening that way as well. And so some of the things that uh, a number of people have said to do, and which I try to do um, as well, is lean into that. And so basically, it's like, just like they say, there's a thin line between love and hate. There's a thin line between anxiety and excitement. And so if you can convince yourself um, that that level, my heart racing is actually, I'm so excited um, to be able to do this interview. I'm so um, enthusiastic to be able to have this opportunity um, for this. 
Um, so that's one thing, kind of like that a psychological preparation. The other thing is, if you know that that's how you, you respond, like 100% of the time that way, is to do some sort of physical activity before. And so then you're also like getting into that groove. So you're like, I know my heart rate's going to jump to 140 beats per minute. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of jumping jacks um, before that, or I'm going to do a quick sprint before the interview. And you might say, well, I might, I don't have, I don't have the ability to do that. So then it might be a matter of just like moving your feet. Um, but whatever you can do um, in terms of being able to, to tell your mind that it's not just um, nervousness, but also that it's some physical movement that you've had um, as well. So, and then the final thing I'll say is um, not that I'm trying to, to, to push medications, but there are times when if uh, that level of heart rate and, and nervousness is so excessive. There are things that people um, do take to regulate that, but I would say probably first try with the the other non-pharmacological things before going that route. Thank you. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. And I have one final question, and I think we can all um, relate to this. It's around virtual interview etiquette. And when doing Zoom interviews, do you suggest blurring backgrounds or what are your recommendations around that? Oh, excellent. Love that. Absolutely. Um, I've seen a number of different things, and I can say that there may be certain preferences that certain programs have, but what I tend to advise people is um, to be comfortable. So I've seen everything from, um, you know, uh, just a grayed out background, like a blurred background. Um, I've seen people with just a blank wall behind them. And then I've seen people where you see their entire background. So I've, I've had people where they love to 3D print. And so you could see their whole room, like all the 3D printers they had in their room or other people would have different artifacts. Um, and I would say that all of them can work. So the biggest thing is if you're going to show a background, um, make sure that, that is strategic. So with the person who loves 3D printing, that was absolutely strategic that I could see all of those things um, because it really sold like um, his additional skill sets um, that really enhanced who he was as a candidate. Or I've seen certain people have certain types of artwork, either their own or as a collector's piece. As I said, it was a great way to be able to discuss hobbies and people were able to like pick up certain things and say and talk about them, right? Because in some interviews, um, your interviewer may ask you, tell me um, about your hobbies or teach me something. And so if you have something you can easily just pull from your background, that can be a great value add that most most people don't have the confidence um, and the, the courage to do it, but it can be great. However, if you're like, I'm not going to do that, um, it is okay to have a blurred background uh, or a white background. I would just uh, mention this, that make sure that you are well lit um, so that you're not having like any shadow uh, casted over your face so that you're like, you know, well lit, um, you know, equally on both sides. Um, and that you don't have anything distracting. So I, I uh, interview a lot of people with glasses. And so sometimes people will have a light and then there'll be a ring light on their glasses. There'll be a glare. And so as the interviewer, I cannot see them. So make sure all of those things are taken care of um, as well. So yeah, in terms of background, um, don't necessarily recommend one or the other unless it's a strategy. Like I said, if you have something and it's important to what you might want to talk about in the interview, go for it. If you're like, I absolutely don't have a 3D printer or special artifacts or things I want to talk about, then make sure that it's it's um, just a blank wall and very well lit um, to be able to present yourself well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Carpenter. That is all the time we have for today. Just really appreciate you giving us your time and all the valuable resources and information you've shared. Um, just for folks who are still on the call, a link to the recording will be available either within the next hour or the next day. So be on the lookout for it. And so just want to thank you all again for joining us. Hope you have a good rest of your day. Yeah, thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you much, uh, everyone. Bye.